Hello folks, once again. Um, today we're going to be moving, um, at least thematically, into the second half of the course today, um, as we speak about humanism in the North. And I want to stress how humanism, as it develops in Northern Europe, is really the transitional point between um, Renaissance ideas and Reformation ideas. We're at the critical juncture where the tools that were developed in Renaissance humanism, the close textual reading, the challenging of authority in some cases, um, the focus on individuals and their experience, um, get translated, <clears throat> in a sense, into close critical text, text reading of the Bible and the patristic literature, meaning the Church Fathers, um, and other ideas that the Church had, um, looking whether they actually jived with the original intentions of Jesus and his followers. Um, and uh, we'll see that uh, it's often been said that you know Erasmus, who was the leading northern humanist of the 16th century, was the chicken that laid the egg that hatched into Luther. And that's a little ridiculous, but in a weird sense, it's true. Um, Luther's uh, anti-clericalism, his criticism of the church, is certainly a direct font that goes right into Reformation thinking. So, so really, um, there is a major strain of, Reforma of uh, humanist thought in Reformation thinking, especially actually with Calvin. Calvin was the real scholar, Luther, um, less so to some extent. He was an Augustinian monk, as we'll, we'll see in, uh, I think, the next lecture. But, um, but there is a definite connection between humanism and uh, the Reformation. Um, and I'm not just going to be talking about religion today. Obviously, I'm going to be talking about um, humanism in general and how the Renaissance gets to the North and eventually how it um, becomes this very, very anti-clerical um, movement. And I'll be talking about other things to do with um, humanism in the North, especially the um, nationalism, very interestingly. You know, it's a totally different context, political context, than the Italian city-states we've been talking about. And as we'll see when we get to um, places like um, Germany and France and England and Spain, um, they take on their own very local flavors, the, the uh, humanist scholarship, um, in a way that, you know, it, that's the, the case is in Italy, it was the case in Italy. Florentine humanism was its own thing, as was, you know, Milanese and Venetian and Roman. But, but here the, the focus is increasingly on nation states and their political and economic agendas. Um, now, let me start by saying first, um, as a, as a kind of caveat to everything that I say for the continuation of the course, um, we have not really gone deeply into religious issues, okay? And certainly not theology at all uh, uh, up until this point. And I just want to say, sort of as a preface to everything that's going to follow, that I have no particular stake in any side that we're going to be talking about in the various reformations. Um, and I point this out because I'm not Christian, never have been, um, so I don't have any polemic. And the reason I say that is historiographically, many of the scholars who've worked on the Reformation have their own very um, denominational prejudices. You know, in other words, they often defend what their ancestors did. Uh, Lutheran scholars definitely, the Jesuit scholars who look at the Catholic Reformation definitely have that, that experience in the back of their head. Um, and I think it is actually very kind of refreshing to come to all of this, not only without any prejudices and without any, you know, sort of pre-made ideas or axes I need to grind because of my own religious beliefs. I have no religious beliefs whatsoever. Let me just, just say that from the outset. Um, I, I'm a completely devout atheist, as I like to tell people. I love the, the theology and I love the trappings of the church. I have no belief whatsoever. Um, and, this, and that was a conscious choice, partly because I was um, raised in a household that was um, at least uh, traditionally uh, Jewish, Sephardic Jewish, and, um, and my parents never participated and never had anything to do with it. They just sent me off to Hebrew school when I was young, actually to an Orthodox Hebrew school, which was a very strange experience. But I think you know, on some level it opened my eyes to understanding what it was like to memorize gibberish, because everything we did was in Hebrew, 
and to obey blindly, which is what they expected of us, and really not to understand what was going on. Now, I, w I want to say that that's not the case in most Reformed um, synagogues, but in this one, it was just complete rote memorization. So in a weird sense, I have a kind of appreciation for what the Protestant uh, Reformers were doing, what they were complaining about in their very... Um, in, you know, growing up in late medieval Catholicism. I, I kind of, I empathize with them. On the other hand, I also, you know, have this very, um, how shall I say, finely honed aesthetic sensibility for the drama of the church and the, you know, the beautiful buildings, the music, especially the incense, the stained glass windows, the art that goes into it. So I have a great deal of sympathy also for the uh, Catholic Reformation and for what went on on the, you know, the, the Catholic side of the, the whole story. So, um, and Calvin appeals to me on a completely intellectual level. Zwingli appeals to me on it. So, so weirdly, um, I can, I can, I get a, a very personal sense for all of these, these individuals and what they were doing. The other thing, the other reason I want to go into this in great detail is, of course, if you went to public school, you know nothing about the Reformation. Um, and even if you learned about it from your own, you know, religious upbringing in a, in a catechism or religious school or something, chances are you didn't get the whole story. You got, you got one side of the whole story. And in public schools, of course, you got nothing because of the whole separation of church and state in the United States. You, you were not allowed to uh, be told anything about the history of the church, which is, of course, central to European history and everything that happens in the 16th and 17th century, um, because they were fearing that you would be proselytized into believing something. And, and that was, uh, you know, and there we do have at least technically a, a separation of church and state. We don't have an official church of the United States. And that was intentional. As we'll see, it comes, it, it's a direct out crop of a uh, direct product of the events we're going to talk about for the very same reason we don't have kings or an aristocracy we don't have a church of the united states um intentionally um so so that's the answer i'm going to try and try and get to uh, by the end of the course but uh to start let's talk about this transition this this uh humanism as it spreads to the north and how Erasmus's ideas will lead um, kind of directly to Luther, um, and why Erasmus, of course, and, and figures like him and Thomas More um, remain Catholic. They don't. They don't make that that switch. And I want to try and explain um, how and why all that happened. Now, let me also say I don't. I usually come with a big with a lot of texts. All of my texts are in my office, and I'm here, and I so I don't. I don't have those. So I'm going to be talking off uh, out of the top of my head on many of this, many of these things. Uh, but I would like to. Um, encourage you, um, if you obviously have time and you're sitting around uh, during this um, this uh, uh, quarantine, to read things like Thomas More's Utopia. It's it's a great book. Um, to read some of Erasmus's colloquies, or if you really have the gumption, to read In Praise of Folly, which is a great book. So that's I'm going to be talking about some of those today, and some other humanists also. Now let's start at the beginning, because I may have given you the impression that the North kind of learned about the Renaissance through the invasions that follow after Charles the the, um, uh, the Eighth of, of France invaded and then the Spanish invaded, and um, that that follows after 1494, and that that's when they learn about Renaissance art and they start bringing artists over. Remember people like Leonardo uh, came to France, and then, and then a, a slew of mannerist painters following them. Um, I think... Uh, um, Il Rosso goes goes to France, and Cellini makes things for Francis I. So I think the um, as does Bronzino, I think also. Um, but in any case, the um, artists literally go go to these countries in the north, and we saw um, uh, for a while this very interesting blending of Renaissance ideals and native traditions in many of those countries. For example, remember those beautiful castles along the Loire Valley that we looked at um, when we were still meeting in person? We looked at Azé le Rideau and, um, and Amboise and Chambord. Well, those are all Italian Renaissance ideals and, and Blois that are all just kind of grafted onto this local tradition of castles in, in, uh, in Loire Valley. So, so there is, but, but I want to say also that the Renaissance ideals, the revival of the classics, um, the new educational ideals, these new modes of artistic expression, well, that stuff actually gets to the North before um, 1494. And I don't want you to think that it's just like, oh, here, this is an Italian phenomenon, and it's grafted onto um, the Northern um, and the rest of Europe. Um, it doesn't work that way, actually. There are indigenous humanist traditions 
in all of those countries that start before. Um, but I think in general, it took a lot longer to catch on because the social context is very different. Remember, there is this rich tradition of Gothic art there that continues in, into the 16th century. I, I think the, one of the greatest ironies is if you see um, Leonardo's tomb, I think I showed you that very briefly, uh, Saint Hubert, is this little tomb uh, near his house in Amboise. It's this beautiful Gothic structure. It's exactly the opposite of what everything Leonardo stood for. But Gothic art is there. I think the other thing to definitely take account of is that in the universities, Paris, Oxford, um, there is scholastic philosophy going on through the 16th century. It doesn't disappear. I hope I haven't given you that impression. The uh, Thomas, you know, the, the philosophy based on Thomas Aquinas, who eventually actually becomes one of the doctors of the church, um, official doctrine um, uh, after the Catholic Reformation. Um, scholastic philosophy based on Aristotelian logic continues through the universities, and it's very strong there, right? The universities aren't going to give up their curriculum, um, and that's not just for um, for the uh, theology. The medical faculties in many there is a medical renaissance, but um, but I think the faculties there continue many of the things that they've been doing through the Middle Ages, and the legal faculty does change. I'll talk about Roman law and the, its revival in just just a moment, but um, but universities are still basically the same as they were before. They don't become humanist, although a few do. A few to take on the whole humanist uh, curriculum. Gonville's and Keyes does in um, Oxford to some extent. Actually, Wittenberg does to some extent also in the in the Germany. We'll see Luther comes out of there. Um, so, um, but that's one thing. But I also want to stress, I think. That remember where the power is in Northern Europe. It's in nobles' hands. It's aristocratic. It's landed wealth. It's among people who really don't have much of a need for an education, right? They're not engaged in business mostly, and they're not. Um, you know, they're still they still have some military function. Of course, they've become courtiers rather than soldiers. Uh, you know, when professional armies develop, but the ideals of kind of Renaissance civic engagement and learning and um, studying the classics, they um, they do catch on because they get the humanist education. It becomes very fashionable to be educated by, uh, and learn Latin. But I think its whole spirit doesn't get translated. I think there is still very much a military, um, night courtial, courteous, court-oriented culture that, that is inherited from the Middle Ages. And if you look at the stuff they read, you know, the popular literature, the chivalric romances, those, of course, still continue through the 16th century. Amadeus of Gaul and um, Esplandian and, and Orlando Furioso, all that stuff has its roots in the Middle Ages. Um, King Arthur is very, very popular. Remember, <laughs> Henry VII names his first son Arthur, hoping that he's going to be the next king. He doesn't survive. Henry VIII <laughs> becomes king. But but still, that, that um, those, those kind of traditions of chivalric Valric, that's the word I was looking for, um, nobility, stay on as, an, as a cultural ideal, even though chivalry is, is dead in real warfare. We remember that from a few lectures back. So, um, so nobles, you know, don't traditionally have a whole lot of learning. They're, they fight and they hunt and they en entertain themselves, but being educated is something that's not easily grafted on to those ideals. Um, and because those people in power are not sort of urban sophisticates and merchants and bankers and, and you know, the, the kind that, that slip into that, that, um, that mode of education very easily. Um, and it just, just takes them longer to accept these new artistic styles and literary styles and, um, and, th and the, the new thought about, you know, the importance of individuals. That, that doesn't fit into a very, very rigidly hierarchic society where aristocrats are born and have nobility whether they deserve it or not. Remember, that's that's a big argument that goes through, is whether nobility is inherent in your blood or it's something you achieve through self-fashioning. Remember the whole idea you know, from Stephen Greenblatt of uh, Renaissance self-fashioning. Um, to what is real nobility is you make yourself a noble by your education and your virtue and your attainments in life. Um, those two things, you know, fight amongst each other because um, aristocrats are not going to give up their position, uh, but they do get, they do get educated eventually. Okay, um, and you know the whole ideas of the dignity of all men that we saw in Pico, the Republican liberty, that stuff is not going to appeal to a society in which born privilege and 
natural superiority are the foundations of what they believe is the foundation of society and its structure. So, so I just want you to see that the ideals change. And I think it's partly why, you know, many of these humanists move to, um, religious topics rather than, rather than civic humanism. Um, so by the late 15th century, especially after that direct contact with Italy, the Italian fashions become uh, predominant in Northern Europe. And by Northern, I include including Spain, although it's Southern Europe also. Let's say North and Western Europe. And, um, and uh, you know, the clothes, this very sumptuous cooking Italian food sets the model after Platina in the 1470s and up through the cookbooks that are published um, in the 16th century, Messrs. Vugo and especially Scappi. And, you know, for the most of the 16th century, Spain is the model in gastronomic uh, literature. Um, and the paintings and the music and the, the, the writing, uh, the literature. So, um, and, and the whole fashion for having uh, educated women also, we'll see, goes to, goes to North. You know, Elizabeth has a humanist education. Elizabeth I, I mean. Um, and Italy becomes the fashion model for Europe. And eventually people go over to this kind of new classical learning um, sometimes superficially, <laughs> superficially, but sometimes, you know, very seriously, I think they, they sometimes take it. Um, and, um, you know, these kind of classical schools we've been talking about, like uh, Virgerius and um, uh, the ones in northern Italy, those, those start popping up in, in uh, northern Europe also. And eventually it becomes considered absolutely necessary to be considered well-bred to have an education and to know some Latin. Um, and uh, to make a trip to Italy is very important. You know, remember when, when Venice sort of stops being the economic powerhouse of the Mediterranean, it becomes a tourist spot. People go there and they go to Rome to see the Italian paintings, to see the classics, to see the ruins of Rome. I mean, that's, that's all, you know, part of being educated. The grand tour all the way up through the 19th century uh, becomes uh, very important. And, um, and a lot of people still go to Italy to study. I think that's very important. The medical, the people who go to, to, um, to Padua to study medicine, the people who go to Bologna to study law or to Bavia, those, those are all very important universities that have slightly, um, they have different curriculum, curricula than in the North. Um, and they bring back these new ideas with them when they, they come home, um, you know, a new kind of learning. And sometimes they get positions in Oxford and Valladolid and wherever, okay? So, so, that's, so universities are a, a connection. Um, and one of the first places we find flourishing centers outside of Italy will be in Germany. And I'm gonna name a few people if you, um, you know, want to, I, I would encourage you to just look up their names. I don't need to spell them all here, but they sound pretty much the way they, they, uh, they spell pretty much the way they sound. So, but let's start with someone like uh, Rudolf Agricola, okay? Um, Agricola had a circle of young humanists around him at the University of Heidelberg. And let me, let me mention Heidelberg, it's such a charming city. Um, it's still there, it still operates as a, as a university. It's one of the oldest in Germany. But what is different about um, Agricola is he is the first to introduce classical Latin, that of Cicero and Quintilian, rather than the medieval um, curricular Latin used in philosophy and theology and medicine and law, um, and classical rhetoric to, um, and I think in, in Agricola's mind also, um, he thought, I remember Germany is to some extent, sort of culturally closer to Italy, in, in not not obviously linguistically and ethnically, they're very different, but they're small city states, very much like Italy. There's, there's no nation state. There's an empire, which is, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, there really is an empire. The emperor does have power, but it's not like the king of England or the king of France or king of Spain. Um, the empire is more loosely connected, and individual cities uh, such as Heidelberg would actually have a lot of um, independence. So I think that's, so that may be one reason why Agricola thought the German nations could surpass Italy. Um, and there are a couple of things that, you know, um, do have their start in Italy. Remember printing, they have their start in Germany. Remember printing this starts there. Gutenberg, um, although he doesn't, um, something really strange happened to Gutenberg. Remember printing the first Bible, but, uh, and, and other works, but he, I think he went into debt and he lost, he had to give up his printing press to his debtor who then opened up a press. And of course, Italy suddenly jumps in uh, almost immediately after by the 1460s or so. But, but Germany does have printing presses, okay? And they'll be, be central to the whole story for the, the rest of the course is what gets printed. 
Um, and let me, let me give you an idea of this sort of circle Rudolf Agricola built around him in Heidelberg. Um, you, know, you know, Heidelberg, let me just mention, there's a, there's a philosopher's way, philosopher's walk, that if you go over the river, there's sort of this path that goes up the side of the mountain that zigs back and forth and goes all the way up. And I did this a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> got a pair of later hoses, in fact, and went all the way up. And what's really strange is you can imagine these medieval and, you know, Renaissance philosophers ruminating over, you know, the thorny issues as they're walking up the whole thing. What's really, what's really strange about it is you get to a certain point and there's this enormous Nazi era amphitheater, which was chilling as hell. Ignore, thousands of people could have sat in there and it was empty. And if you walk past that, it goes all the way, all the way up to the top. There's a beer garden, which the Germans get right for hiking. There's always a beer at the top. And then there's the ruins of a medieval monastery. It was just so, so weird how the, you know, transitions of, of very, very distinct periods just as you're walking up this mountain. So anyway, Heidelberg. Who does Rudolf Agricola get around him? Well, the first of the, his um, disciples is Conrad Keltis, C-E-L-T-I-S, who became a poet and actually a poet laureate of the empire. So he kind of gets a title like... Um, Petrarch had, right, the, as poet laureate. Um, and like Petrarch, he thought of himself as a poet and philosopher and, um, and heralded in his writings what he thought would be a new golden age of German culture and literature. And you know that happens over and over and over again. But, it's, um, but his, his idea was that the Germans could rival the Italians and do better because they had as much... Um, you know, historical roots and, and material wealth and everything that the Italians did. So it's a kind of nationalism, if you want to think of it that way. Even though there's no nation of Germany, there's this kind of um, emphasis on German accomplishment, German meaning linguistically and culturally. Um, and in uh, 1497, um, the emperor, this is Maximilian I, they invited him to found a new college in Vienna, um, and he, um, you know, taught there for some time. Uh, remember, there's there's no border between Austria and Germany at this point, so Vienna would have been the capital of the empire. Um, I guess it was Prague before then, and then they moved it to Vienna. But in any case, the um, you know it goes back to Prague later with Rudolf. But in any, any case, Vienna is the capital. Um, the Habsburg Empire, um, and um, he founds this college there, which is a humanist kind of um, curriculum, and he um, taught there until 1508, when he died of syphilis. And we'll, we'll come to the whole story of syphilis in a moment, though. Um, but because of men like this, it became very, um, not just fashionable, but necessary for every landed princip principate, you know, or prince, or bishop, whatever, you know, the empire has lots of different kinds of rulers, landgrave, whatever. Um, but all of them have a Latin secretary after this that gets a, this kind of training. Uh, so for diplomatic communication, for all official, you know, documents of state, that all happens in classical Latin. You would also hire a rhetorician to write your speeches. And, you know, um, and so this kind of Latin culture gets imbued in these small civic governments where if you were to have, say, a... Um, procession, you would, you know, dress up as Apollo and have columns and, you know, and all these classical references and in, in, in mottos and things in your triumphal arches. And you'll have, um, you know, uh, proper poems to be to serve as propaganda. And I think, uh, you know, Maximilian uh, had this uh, poem, uh, he patronized, uh, I'm trying to think of who wrote this, it must be Celtus, um, called the Weisskönig, means the White King. Um, that is, uh, I can't remember who it is now, now, but it, but in any case, it's, it's very much like we saw, you know, the, the, um, sports, uh, in, um, Milan making the Sforziad or, and, and we'll see, you know, the, the Luchadas in Portugal, the, um, um, poetry serves as propaganda, just as Virgil had for the Roman Empire. Um, but for Rome... Let me also mention Roman law. That becomes standard everywhere. And I want to, want to sort of just briefly touch on, on le the legal changes. Um, this happens, it starts earlier than this. But Roman law based on Justinian's code, uh, the whole idea that you have a panel of judges who decide upon uh, 
the, the uh, outcome of the case after listening to witnesses, very different from the much earlier medieval traditions, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, of having a jury and having people come in and bear testimony and then the jury of your peers makes the decision for guilt or innocence. The judge is there as the, the kind of ringleader and give the sentence, but not the verdict. Um, so those are two very different kinds of legal systems. And the Roman law begins to predominate in the late Middle Ages. It starts, but you know, when people are going to Bologna and they're learning this new, new uh, legal system, Latin um, tends to become used in court. And the, the England's a weird exception because it's, it's got these other Saxon traditions that stay there. But in, you're talking about France, in much of Germany, definitely in Spain, um, Roman law predominates where the um, person is guilty until proven innocent, okay? So, you know, when you hear about all these strange legal things, it's, it's Roman law that they're, they're using largely. Um, and, and, and you can see Roman law is used as a, as a tool of state. Remember all these sort of law courts that these new nation states set up? They are, you know, the, those quick and efficient legal systems like the Star Chamber in England, those are mostly Roman law. Roman law doesn't take as long. You don't need all the, you know, you need a jury to convince. You don't need the, the lawyers to come. I mean, there are, there are advocates, but they're not the same as a lawyer um, in the British and American legal system. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing, Renaissance art, of course, you know, influences German art directly. I think the best example is Albrecht Dürer. We haven't spoken really much about Northern uh, Renaissance art quite so much, but Dürer went to Italy um, learned um, to paint uh, an exquisite painter. And Dürer, you know, his portraits, his painted bunnies. I mean, it's, if, I, if I have time, I'll give you a, another lecture um, on Northern Renaissance art, especially Flanders is really where it starts. And it's long, it's, that's 15th century. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, the things like the, the new perspective system, the new realism, the anatomical, the focus on the human anatomy, um, and, and I think, you know, apart from Dürer, Holbein is really the person to look at. Um, Hans Holbein was a German painter who eventually went to the court of Henry VIII and painted everyone, painted the big image of uh, Henry that you recognize and, um, and of young Edward and, and uh, Anne Boleyn and the whole, he painted the whole court and just, just an exquisitely frightening realism. Um, Holbein painted uh, the portraits, the twin portraits of Sir Thomas More and um, um, Thomas Cromwell. Um, they're facing each other. If you're ever in New York and go to the Frick Gallery, um, they're facing each other in one room. The, the Frick bought both of them, uh, both based, painted by Holbein. Moore looks like this extraordinarily sympathetic, worried figure with a five o'clock shadow, and um, um, Cromwell looks like a complete jerk, which he was. <laughs> so, yeah, if you, I mean, read Wolf Hall if you want a uh, Hillary Mantle. It's a great, great uh, set of, it's fictional, but it's, but it's largely based on reality. If you want to see what a, a bizarre person Cromwell was. Anyway, different course. Um, we'll, we'll get to England in just a moment. But what I was talking about was Holbein and Dürer and um, the Northern Renaissance painters that are influenced by the Italian Renaissance, which is, uh, which is directly and also, uh, like in Italy, we get the civic humanists. I think the person here I would focus on, I would mention, is the city councillor of Nuremberg. Nuremberg is this little rich um, German city um, who wrote a history of the uh, Schwabian War. He wrote in Greek also. And this is Willibald Perkheimer, okay? And I would mention, don't worry about how to spell his name, Perkheimer. Um, I always remember him because the first time I set eyes on a, on a portrait of him, um, I said, he looks exactly like my Uncle Bernie. <laughs> he did, I swear to God. <laughs> Total bizarre, but uh, Perkheimer in um, Nuremberg. And then there are also figures analogous to the Neoplatonists. I, and I want to mention one figure here especially because he started a kind of controversy over the kind of research that he was doing. This is Johannes Reuchlin, uh, R-E-U-C-H-L-I-N decided, like those syncretist philosophers like, you know, uh, Ficino and Pico della Mirandola, who thought that you could gather in all sorts of different traditions of different religions, not just Judaism, but Zoroastrianism and uh, Hermes Trismegistus, 
Well, Reuchlin decided if they were, and this is key to this entire story we're going to talk about in the Re Reformation, Reuchlin decided that if they were going to comment on the Old Testament, the whole, you know, the majority of the Bible is the Hebrew part, um, just as people had been reading Greek of the New Testament, he thought you had to learn Hebrew if you really wanted to understand the Old Testament. And that is some, something no non-Jew in Europe would have done uh, before his time. But he said, let's make this part of the curriculum. You know, we've, got, we've gotten so far as good classical Latin and we've got good Greek. Um, how can we stop without knowing Hebrew? Which, remember that whole idea that the older something is, the closer it is to the original knowledge and the truer it must be. Well, Hebrew is closer. <laughs> Hebrew, you know, may have been the original language, or who knows. But they, um, but they certainly knew it was very, very old. So he um, went and, um, you know, um, went to Hebrew scholars, learned uh, how to read ancient Hebrew, which is, which I, sh I should mention, was not a living language at that time. It's a liturgical language. It's actually still not a living language. People know. Modern Hebrew is kind of half invented and um, was a revival of the 20th century. Ancient Hebrew had stopped being spoken, even at the time of Jesus, he spoke Aramaic, right? Not, not Hebrew. So, um, but in any case, Reuchlin believed that what was in the Old Testament was a prophesied what happened in the New. Remember, Isaiah says, Lo, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us, if you know that, the Messiah. Um, but that the, um, it corroborated what happened in Christian Revelation, and you really couldn't understand that unless you understood not just the, uh, well, the Old Testament got translated uh, by Greek scholars into a set of texts called the Septuagint, it was 70 scholars, and then that Greek version got translated into Latin by Jerome, which was, you know, Jerome was a, <laughs> not a good classical scholar, let's put it that way. Uh, not that he made mistakes, but he did actually, you know, and, and he used a kind of, you know, ordinary Vulgate Latin, which is what, what the, that translation is called. So it made sense that Reuchlin would say, look, look, let's just go back to the Hebrew. We may have gotten things wrong, um, and sometimes they did, you know, that sometimes they, they, you know, Hebrew, no one spoke it. So it was, it was a hard language to learn. But he had this whole same idea. Reuchlin believed that, you know, we could also include the numerological stuff. We could include the Pythagoreans and the Orphic mysteries and all the Greek traditions were also part of this. So he was the kind of last real syncretist before we get to the Catholic Reformation, which is gonna make that kind of thought completely impossible. And Reuchlin actually got in a lot of trouble for this. Um, one of the major controversies of the early 16th century was the um, emperor decided that the Jewish communities should turn in their books to be burned. You know, it was not the Nazis who invented that, that lovely trick. Um, this happened uh, long before then, and Reuchlin said, we must not burn these texts because they are our tradition also, and we have to learn from them, not be, um, you know, not destroy that culture, or we will not understand our own, or just, or even just because it's, it's there, we, we need to know about it. And he got the support of all sorts of humanists. I, I kind of sometimes think this was, Reuchlin was kind of like the Dreyfus affair of the, of the 16th century. Um, and we'll, we'll pick up, you know, the story of um, how this German humanism feeds directly to Luther, because it does. It's the same place, it's just a couple of years apart that this, this all happens. So let's get to, let's go to France, okay? So you know that the, the whole tradition is established in Germany by the 16th century. Humanism in France begins before Charles VIII invades Italy. Um, and I think it's safe to say that the attention really focuses on Italian things um, much more when we, after 1494, after this direct contact. But um, even after that, Italian Renaissance ideas were mixed with these French traditions. Um, the Chateau of the Loire, as I, as I mentioned, and the ornamental features and the, you know, the uh, Italian um, painters who come to, to France um, really makes it a very different kind of mix of the two. Um, maybe I'll give you another example that comes to mind is Rabelais, who is a humanist who writes this wonderful book about this giant um, Gargantua and Pantagruel, 
and uh, all the and it's just such a completely bizarre, scatological, dirty, disgusting <laughs> story about what these giants do and eat. But it's but it's embedded in this is a is a kind of um, moral story about humanism. So so he so that is you know a fusion of these two traditions uh, definitely in French literature. But I think that let's talk about the serious. Um, not that Rabelais isn't serious. He's not serious. He's silly. But the 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 academic humanists. Um, first and foremost among these is Guillaume Boudet, B U D E with a an accent over it, um, who was not only devoted to the classics but took those tools for reading ancient texts and said, let's use them for biblical, you know, religious literature also. Um, and he was a thoroughly religious figure in a way that, that, that the Italian humanists weren't pagan, mostly. They weren't irreligious, but I think in the North you'll find that religion is far more on the minds of these humanists. Um, it's far less secular than, than the Italians. Um, and... Um, you know, religion plays a central role to such an extent that many people would call this Christian humanism. And I think that's not, that's not an unfair title at all, because part of what they are concerned about is not just the improvement of the society, but the improvement of the morals of people, getting people to do good things and behave well and... Uh, and, you know, using the classical tools to do that. Not, not that the Italians were not for that, but here it, it more closely aligns with the, the revival, or let's say the improvement of Christian morals is, is definitely in their mind. And Boudet was a, both a Latin and Greek scholar. He wrote books about language, so he kind of fits into that whole milieu with the other Italians. Um, Francis I um, had him found a collegium trilingue. Now let's think about this for a second. Three language university that the curriculum is taught in three. That's in 1530. Um, it eventually becomes the Collège de France. So, so it's a, a, a humanist school that's outside the old Paris, you know, um, university, university of Paris. And, um, and he also established a library at Fontainebleau, which is the, the last of those great uh, Renaissance chateaus. It's not so far from... Uh, Paris, but it's uh, Fontainebleau is, is the, arguably the, the greatest of them until you get to uh, Versailles. But the library at Fontainebleau becomes the basis for the Bibliothèque Nationale. So kind of the way that the, you know, the uh, Laurentian Library in Florence becomes the, uh, you know, the, a great li public library later. Um, the same thing happens for national libraries um, and uh, France. The, you know, obviously the Bibliothèque Nationale is one of the greatest libraries in the world, is founded right there. But the person who I think makes that transition better, or the, or the connection between the humanist ideals and the religion, is uh, Jacques Lefebvre d'Etape, okay? And the name to remember is Lefebvre, L-E-F-E-V-R-E, -E -E, um, went actually and studied in Florence, uh, came in contact with the whole Neoplatonism of Ficino, um, but also with the kind of Aristotelian scholastic uh, stuff that was being taught in Padua. Um, and his, uh, Lefebvre's primary concern was in fact theological. And as a good humanist, he said, let us read the original texts in their original language, study them critically to understand the words, to understand the historical context, to set the, you know, to understand the changing nature of language so we can date and understand those texts. And the stuff that he really looked at was mostly the, the Greek church fathers. So we're talking here about people like St. Basil, Chrysostom, um, you know, the, the people who wrote in Greek, not, not the Latin ones, um, and thought that he could harmonize the Greek philosophy with the theology. And, and, you know, for many of these people, there is a real connection in ancient times. Um, but I think the thing that, that Lefebvre did that really revolutionizes this trend in thought is he um, took the Greek New Testament. Now, now remember, when that thing, those texts were written, the first language of those authors was Aramaic, right? Jesus and his disciples spoke Aramaic. They wrote it in Greek so it could be understood in the entire, you know, Mediterranean world. And, uh, you know, the Greek was the lingua franca of that era and, and of education and philosophy. They spoke a kind of very simple Greek, though. It was not 
um, <clears throat> you know, technically sophisticated like Plato or Aristotle, um, but he thought, let me take these same humanistic tools, apply them to the New Testament and read it in the original, not in Jerome's translation. Um, and he wrote these uh, epistles to St. Paul, under, really trying to understand what St. Paul was all about, which was not necessarily the same conclusions that were in official dogma of the Catholic Church. And so that's, so this is the real danger. When people remember the Catholic Church does not necessarily want people to read the text of the Bible, because what if they come up with their own interpretation or their own understanding of it, and that disagrees with the dogma? So remember, the Catholic Church in this point, even up into the, this this time period, um, no one reads the, the Bible unless you're a scholar, and everyone reads St. Jerome's Vulgate translation to read the original Greek, or heaven forfend the Hebrew, um, but, but the Greek New Testament, you know, reading Paul's epistles, coming to different conclusions, kind of opens up this big, you know, controversy. Um, and, uh, you know, the the standard uh, interpretation is now under threat. I think that's the important thing. And he will directly, directly influence the reformers who will say, yes, everyone should read the Bible. And, of course, we, we'll see translations. And, um, and you know, the, and the point that, that I want to, the, the theological point that I kind of want to just introduce here, because we'll come back to it, is that if you were reading Peter very closely, there are passages where he says that what gets you into heaven is not the things you do, the works, and we'll talk about this next time in great detail, um, but the faith, that only faith gets you saved, and that in a sense, once you have faith, all the other stuff doesn't really matter. Uh, faith alone, sola fide, is what gets you saved. Now, there are other texts that say, opposite uh saint james this says what good is is um faith uh, without works it's like a fruit a tree without any fruit right and everything has to bear, bear practical consequences so this will be a major theological issue we'll come to next time but i think lefebvre's commentaries on the new testament and pointing out this fact are a real threat to catholic orthodoxy right because they're saying you don't need to go on pilgrimages or worship saints or do any of that stuff because your faith is going to get you saved, that's dangerous. And it's and it's financially dangerous for the church too, right? Remember, they're trying to raise money and this guy's saying, what? I don't need to give you money for, you know, building St. Peter's? So we will come back to this point. But let's go on to Spain because Spain is just as important in all of this. In brief, there is a very, in Spain, there is a brief but ultimately suspended humanist movement. Um, it is suspended because the Catholic Reformation, the Inquisition especially, uh, cracks down on it, associating humanism with Protestantism, with uh, lapsed uh, Jude Judaizing, you know, people who converted formally and slipped back. So they don't under really understand what humanism is, but there is this brief moment of brilliance in, in Spain that comes to a, to a short end. And one monument of, um, of late 15th century humanism in Spain was the work of um, the Cardinal um, Jiménez de Cisneros, who was the Archbishop of Toledo, one of Ferdinand and Isabella's sort of most powerful ministers. He sponsored the publication, and I want, to, want you to think of the importance of this, of a polyglot Bible. Now, what that means, it's the... Um, uh, Complutensian polyglot. It, in, a, in any case, it's got the Hebrew there. I think it has what they called Chaldean, which was Aramaic. It has the Greek. It has Latin. So you can actually compare the columns as you go along. Now, just in terms of translations and the original language side by side, that's that's innovative in itself. But to have this in one book where you can open the thing and compare directly, anyone can, and it's printed. That's the whole point. It goes all over the place. Um, it's kind of revolutionary because anyone with a knowledge of those languages can look and say, hmm, is that what that really means, <laughs> this original text? Um, you have a lot of critical eyes looking at those texts and potentially reinterpreting it. That, that's, that's, that's the whole point. So the polyglot Bible with Hebrew, Chaldean, Greek, Latin columns for comparison is one thing. The other is um, the founding of the University of Alcala, 
okay? Spelled just like my last name, but with a C and an accent at the end, um, is um, a there, you know, kind of the, the um, humanist curriculum uh, gets put in there um, and it becomes eventually a, a kind of humanist school. Um, but what comes out of there are a series of dictionaries and grammars um, and the very first dictionary in a vernacular language. This is a nebricha, is the first, it's a Spanish dictionary. <laughs> so, so when you think about the whole idea of a correct way of spelling things and opening up a dictionary and finding it, uh, this is this sets the precedent for, for all dictionaries that follow, all the way down to Noah Webster and, um, you know, that whole idea of standardization of language really begins uh, with this. And, and, you know, Latin, there's been Latin dictionaries, up, you know, before, slightly before this, but the vernacular now um, is infected by this idea of correctness. And, and of course, you know, to be educated, to pass in a certain social class, you need to have this education and know how to spell correctly. Uh, that doesn't get to England for another century or more. Um, you know, remember Shakespeare spelled his name three different ways. There was no standardized spelling. If you were in the North, they spelled words as they sounded, as they spoke them. Um, the standardization happens with the expansion of the central, the power of the crown, right? And having the laws in one standard language, having correspondence, having news, having such that we get to the 20th century where there is a right way and wrong way to spell almost everything for no good reason. I mean, it's just random arbitrary. Someone makes it up at some point, um, but you have to learn it <laughs> if you want to pass as an educated person and get a job and, you know, you have to know the correct way to do things. So, it's, so it starts with Nebricha. Um, and also, you know, the other thing is that this um, sort of circle of humanists in Spain were interested in reforming clerical abuses. Now, I will talk about those in detail in the next lecture, but it's the things that the church is doing, selling positions, clerical ignorance, keeping concubines, I mean, those kind of things that they want to improve and improve public morality in such a way that most of these people are become Erasmians, the Spanish humanists look at Erasmus in the Netherlands, which is part of Spain still, um, as uh, their model. And, um, and uh, so they become real Christian humanists. Um, and the idea is this kind of spiritual regeneration of Christianity without any intention of breaking away from Rome, uh, but still being critical of the Pope. And you can understand why they would have had, you know, gripes with the Pope. The, the, Popes at this time were people like Leo X and Julius II carrying a sword. I mean, we'll, we'll come back to that also. Um, and, and it's this kind of, this first generation of Spanish humanists that gets in trouble with the Inquisition precisely because, and maybe the connection is real in their minds, uh, because of the connection between Erasmianism and Lutheranism. And they just assume Protestants and humanists, they're the same thing. They're all critical of the church. Let's hunt them all down as... Um, and so most of the humanists are either um, forced to be quiet, which they do, or switch to different topics in theology, or they go into exile. And I think the exiled ones are the really interesting. Um, so humanism does not flourish in Spain at all. It, did, it dies in its tracks right there. But it flourishes in places that are the Spanish humanists in exile go to places like Bruges, in, in the Netherlands, Spanish Netherlands, you know, in the, the um, it's now Belgium, where they go to Oxford in some cases. So one of these people I want to talk about is Juan Vives, as you would say if you were speaking um, an American Spanish. Um, Bibeth. <laughs> in Castilian, Castiliano Vulgo. It's V-I-V-E-S, but the V is pronounced like a B and an S, or it's Bibes. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing myself, but in any case, it's Vives, if you want to say it the way we do in Spanish, um, and um, wrote about all sorts of interesting questions of social inequality. He is the first humanist to really promote um, the education of women um, on an, e not, I shouldn't say an equal level with men, but, but that all women should be educated and learn about, you know, study Latin and the classics. Um, and the idea... I think of Vives that, that makes him so interesting and, and influential also is that he believed that the problems of society and of poverty are social problems. They're, they don't have to do with any inherent corruption in the individuals themselves. 
They have to do with the structure of society and the way we treat those people that leads them to immorality or crime even. And the solution to this would be, rather than keep people poor and force them to steal, is um, have a system of land redistribution, provide jobs, do things that are going to make those people financially solvent so that they will not have to turn to crime. Um, Vives is a <laughs> remarkably modern thinker in that respect, um, and really very admirable. And I know we, we touched on him very briefly, um, but he is the, um, you know, he's in the major current of the Renaissance thought about the whole, you know, dignity of man and, uh, you know, humans can improve themselves by pulling up their bootstraps and behaving and, um, and they are not irreparably sinful. Now, I mention this because this thread of Erasmianism in Spain and, of course, in Erasmus himself, is very optimistic on one level, right? It believes that humans can improve themselves, do well, and, in a kind of sense, earn their salvation. Luther will say exactly the opposite, and that's the real dividing point, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll come to that also. But humans are not irreparably sinful. We can, like Pico said, become, you know, rise up like angels, or we could become like, uh, you know, insects, but it all depends on us and our um, willingness to do something. So, um, so Vives is, is in that whole thread, and there's a line from Pico directly to him. So, and he wrote that educational tract, if you remember, we mentioned him briefly, I think a few weeks ago. But let's get to Erasmus. Uh, Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam uh, in the Netherlands is certainly the most important humanist, um, probably not just of, of, of the North, probably not just of this group of Christian humanists, but of all humanists, I could say in some respects, he is among the most important um, because he traveled all over the, the place. He went to France, he went to England, he was in Italy, he ends up in Basel in, in Switzerland. Um, he influenced that whole generation of 16th century humanists, um, influenced the present, you could say, um, but he becomes the leader of the entire movement. Um, there's, there are great portraits of him too. Look at the portrait by um, Holbein. Um, and he became also the correspondent of kings. Henry VIII invited him to England, Francis I invited him. So he is a superstar scholar. And you know, we scholars, we have to, you know, latch on <laughs> to those people who make it to real fame, but he's certainly the most famous uh, person of that generation also. Um, the Pope actually wanted to make him a cardinal. He, he didn't, but, um, uh, but, but he, an extraordinarily popular and influential. And I think also he kind of steers all of Europe toward his own variety of Christian humanism um, in volumes and volumes and volumes of writing. His, his output is prodigious, if not incredible. Um, the University of Toronto has been translating and publishing his works Gosh, it's got to be more than the, the past 50 years. I don't think they're even done yet with, with them. Um, and he wrote a whole lot. But, um, but the important thing about Erasmus is he outlines a program for moral reform that would return the church to, to whatever extent possible to its original lines of Christian simplicity and purity. And to do that, he believed we should look at the book itself, the, the, the Bible, the New Testament itself, as a means of reforming the church. Now, that doesn't mean breaking away. That doesn't mean getting rid of the Pope. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, becoming, uh, abandoning Roman Catholicism. In fact, in many respects, he was very much into this and idea of a universal church, as, as many other people were. Um, but he believed that it could be reformed, that we could have better popes, better educated clergy, better people who would obviously go to heaven more often than they were doing. Um, and to do this, he thought we would have to use the Bible as, as, a, uh, as the guide, and we have to have a good critical translation of it. We have to know what the text really meant if we're get, and what it said in Greek if we're going to use it as a basis for our own behavior. So you can see this is, this is the real danger here um, in the minds of the, the church. Uh, and, um, you know, looking at the original Greek, hoping that eventually everyone could read it and understand it is, I think, his ultimate goal. Um, and to uh, remove 
all the sort of nonsense that's been added to Christianity by the church, the traditions, the, the remnants of paganism that are there, but things that were added actually since the very beginning. And I shouldn't say nonsense. I think just, just let's say the other traditions that are non-biblical that are there, which do, he believed, very little to improve people's morals. In other words, the demands to go on pilgrimages and venerate relics that really make people better? <laughs> that's, that's, that's his real question. Um, and he believed that, you know, those things should be removed if they're not essential, because the real goal is to improve society. It's not to have wealthy churches where people come and on their knees and pray to, a, you know, the crown of thorns or Mary Magdalene's teeth. Um, and so his suggestion um, in many, many of his writings is to scrap the relics, the veneration of saints, the repetitions of prayers for the souls of the dead, the uh, pilgrimages, the ignorant monks, the pointless rituals, the things that I mean, people were just kind of obeying the letter of the law and were not really understanding the spirit or listening to a mass in Latin, which you don't even understand, right? People don't know Latin. Um, and Christianity should be useful to humans. That's the humanist thread there, right? Um, that it should make them better. Um, and the tool to do that is philology, right? It's the study of the language to look at those texts and understand what they really meant and, um, you know, help Christians in, um, in, in their practical everyday needs, not in making the church wealthy. Um, so this directly influences the Reformation, as we will see, um, and the theological differences really ultimately come down to this idea in Erasmus um, of human perfectibility which is a total Renaissance idea, and the Reformation idea of complete moral depravity of humans, which is Luther. Those two are irreconcilable. <laughs> the idea that you can, you know, gain merit, do good works, even if they don't mean, you know, praying to relics, doing good things and becoming a good human and getting into heaven is the humanist way. Erasmian, totally. Um, Luther abandons that. So we, we, we shall see. Um, and, and of course, Erasmus was never willing to break from the Catholic Church. He thought there needed to be one universal church, one head, one pope. Um, and, uh, you know, his, um, and in that respect, he's very much like Thomas More. Who, they were friends. Um, Thomas More, you know, rejected the Reformation when it, when it came to England. So the, the work of his that is most um, important is a snippet of satire. It's modeled after the... Greek um, writer Lucan, who's a satirist, very difficult to read. Uh, it's called In Praise of Folly, and it is still in print. I mean, you can buy a paperback version of it. I have tried having people in this class read it, and it has always failed because it's just such a difficult, it's so complexly satirical that I think unless you know the original and you know what's going on in it, it just doesn't work um, for a text for modern people. And, and, and it's gone so out of fashion. People just don't like it. But it, essentially, it's about, it's a satire praising folly. And it's basically saying that everyone is an idiot, which is true. But still, you know, it's, um, it's hard to read because the, the way that it talks is, you know, folly is, is the, the, the heroine of the whole thing. Um, and instead of denouncing how ignorant and superstitious and foolish people are, it sarcastically says how wonderful that people are so ignorant and superstitious and, and the greatest goddess of, uh, you know, bring uh, all, everyone uh, praise to her, who's, who is folly. Um, and the, the interesting other thing about it is in Latin, the word is encomia morii, in morii, like moron, it's the, the cognate word in English, but it's a play on words because it's dedicated to Thomas More, who's his friend. <laughs> and he's not calling his friend a moron. He's just, he's, doing some silly wordplay. So anyway, this is 1509. But the importance of the book is it is a, an attack of the church and its practices using the original biblical text as a guide to Christian living. And his goals here, well, they're, I don't think he's an evangelical, <laughs> evangelical but, but they're, it's for making people better, definitely. Um, and the idea that the Bible should be read and education should gear people toward those goals. I think that's that's totally in Erasmus's mind. Um, very different approach than scholastic theology, right? I mean, scholastic approach, 
It was abstract technical questions that most people couldn't understand at all, um, defining points of metaphysics, you know, the whole the whole cliche was how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, you know, useless kind of things. I don't know if anyone ever actually said that, but um, but things that exist outside the individual that um, essentially say, you will believe what we um, say, and if you don't, we're going to torture you for your own good, <laughs> but you have to be orthodox. In other words, it was this whole contrast, as we were talking before, between scholastic learning, which was by rote memorization, and then or to some extent regurgitation as opposed to the, the humanist idea which was you let the, the person discover and understand the moral lessons themselves by um, by interacting with the, with the stuff and then they believe themselves right rather than you do what I say because I said and if you don't we're going to punish you so Erasmus believed again that the individual has the ability to understand on his own um, that we should read the text and you can become a better person. So his focus is, of course, ethics, you know, in, in a real sense. Um, and this, and this, the, his impulses, um, I guess you could look at all philosophers and pin them in one direction or another, but his idea is that people are basically good. You know, it's society that makes them bad. If we encourage, you know, good behavior and morality, and people will discover it and understand why it's better for them. It, rather than just uh, threaten them and with hellfire and uh, you know and yell at them, uh, and he believed also that you know even people who were ignorant of the gospel had uh, you know a certain kind of understanding of natural law and were imbued with goodness. And if that wasn't corrupted by bad influences, they could be saved. I mean, remember this whole idea of noble savages, you know, interacting with the the, the people they discovered in the new world and saying, wait, this is kind of strange. They've never read the gospel. Yet they're good they're, because they haven't been influenced by inequality and um, you know all the bad customs of, of Europeans. So that's that's where he fits in, um, and um, you know, so the text that usually I would read at this point um, is the Colloquies. And let me just explain what those are. The Colloquies were a set of um, ostensibly lessons to young students on how to learn Latin, which they are, weirdly. But they all, they tell these stories that unfold in very interesting ways about, um, about all, all sorts of anti-clerical topics. You know, you know um, the silliness of relics, the silliness of swearing by parts of uh, Jesus's body, the, um, the, uh, there's so there's so the, it's they're funny and satirical and very easy to understand um and i think you know i might have a little snippet here maybe i don't um no i have the godly feast which is a little too detailed but the but the colloquies i would say um plane flying overhead if you have a chance to um read a snippet of these read the shipwreck which is really funny it's these guys who are praying to god that they'll reform if the ship comes to, comes to uh, uh, the shore. Um, the pilgrimage is also very, very interesting. Um, it talks about the silliness of people going on pilgrimages, you know, and being really rotten people in the end anyway. Um, and it's much of what this thing talks, what the books talk about is the emptiness of ritual that's done for its own sake that, you know, people, uh, that doesn't make people better but uh, they go through the motions and that's what they consider to be religiosity. So, so I'll, I'll leave you to, um, you know, talk about the colloquies um, if you like, but the figure I want to sort of um, conclude this talk with is Thomas More, who is a really difficult figure to get a hold of, um, to get a grasp on, because there are, uh, the utopia is, uh, in fact, he invents the word, writes, it just means nowhere. He makes up that word, but Thomas More, in the context of uh, humanism is like Erasmus, um, and as, as I said, they were friends, insofar as when the king, Henry VIII, decides to abandon the, um, the authority of the Pope and declare himself head of the church, um, Moore tries to save his neck, he doesn't, um, and he, his head is removed. But before all that happens, Thomas More um, did some nasty business for Henry in actually hunting down heretics. And so you could, I'll never forget when I was uh, in grad school, one of my um, teachers uh, 
said, you know, Thomas More was the biggest shit <laughs> in English history because he, you know, had, gives all these wonderful, um, he seems like such a nice person <laughs> in Utopia. And then he goes heretic hunting. And yeah, I guess that's true. Okay. So, but we'll give him that. But let's think about the Utopia itself. So the whole pretext of the Utopia is this, and I'm going to just ramble off the top of my head about this. I haven't done it in a, in a couple of years, but um, is this guy, Raphael Heiflo Day, uh, talks about uh, a journey that he went to, this is fictional, of course, to the New World. This is the whole second half of the book. And it's based on that letter from Vespucci, remember, that was published. Um, and he meets these people, presumably somewhere in South America, that don't have private property. In effect, there's gold lying all around the place and they don't consider it interesting. The implication being that gold is what really makes people in Europe corrupt. They have a kind of religion, but it's very um, universal and open and syncretic. And it looks like Christianity, but they don't have any Christian um, Christianity, but they anyone can believe what they want. Uh, you don't have, they don't force you to believe. And again, that's the point where Moore's own uh, enforcing the orthodoxy seems a little suspect because in the utopia, um, it's not free thought, but it's, but it, in, but everyone's allowed to believe what they want. Um, but there's a kind of open pantheistic, beautiful love in religion <laughs> there. Uh, but more importantly is, um, they don't take over other countries for conquest and you, uh, the people they make slaves are those who commit crimes. They do hard work as the, their uh, punishment. Um, or they make them butchers, which is very interesting. Ordinary people aren't allowed to kill because uh, it will make them bloodthirsty. And the, the, the upshot of the whole thing is that they live peacefully. And uh, these people, here's the most interesting part to me, is the, the idea of work. He said, look, the reason that we all have to work so hard is because we have parasitic classes in Europe. We have the king, crown. We have aristocracy, who, and we have the church, who live off the labor of other people and don't really produce or do anything. They live off the land or they pray for people's souls. Big whoop. Um, but if we were to make everyone labor, we could reduce the amount of the number of hours that everyone works to six hours a day, which would be great. And then we would have all this free time to read and appreciate art and make music and enjoy things. And in fact, so and he's right about that, of course. But you know, the interesting thing is he still thinks labor is not really fun. You get, you do it, and you get it over with, and you spread the burden around so that no one really has stuck with working all the time. And then everyone could have access to culture and humanist culture, right? Especially so that everyone could be educated, everyone could be good. Um, and, it's, and it's of course a fictional story of these people set in the new world, but it's meant to criticize. Europe, right? I mean, it's it's a mirror facing directly at Europe. Look at these good people living happily, not fighting wars, not persecuting each other, not living in incredible inequality. Yet they're not Christians, folks. <laughs> and it's a mirror to, for Europeans to look at themselves and go, oh, I guess we are doing some bad things. Maybe there is some inequality. Maybe, maybe they, we are killing people in wars for no good reason. So so I think the utopia <clears throat> kind of opens people's minds to possibilities, to self-criticism. Um, it's not a political tract, okay? And, and I know sometimes people read this in a political science course. Um, it looks, interestingly, like, like Plato's Republic in some respects also. That's another strange thing about it. But it's, um, but I think it is a moral tract. It is a, a thing for people to look at and turn upon themselves and say, if there are these supposed savages living happily and not greedy and stabbing each other in the back, but living communally and happy without property, without inequality, without all these things, um, maybe we can edge in that direction somewhat. It, it is a moral track more than anything. It's, the, I mean, the very name implies utopia, nowhere. It's not really a place. These people don't really exist. But um, its importance historically is, of course, that people did try to set up utopias. In fact, even in his own day, Jesuits went into um, South America 
and tried to <laughs> set force the Native Americans into these structures that looked like the utopian cities. Um, completely bizarre. And then, of course, you know, when you get to the 19th century utopian socialists, um, um, you know, the phalanxes, Fourier, um, New Lanark Mills, you know, all those very interesting um, utopian experiments are influenced by utopia, even though it's not really a political tract. It's, it's a humanist tract to try and make people better. Um, but the uh, word utopia and the idea becomes we can actually put this into effect in society and make people work. So again, if you have the time, read the utopia. Um, it's, it's a great work of literature, unlike, um, I shouldn't say unlike Erasmus, it's much easier to read. It's very easy to read, in fact. Um, and um, let me read you a passage, as, I, as long as we're sitting here, and I think I do have a little bit here. Um, there's a little little passage on pleasure, because of course, remember, the Catholic Church said pleasure is inherently sinful. If you're an ascetic, you beat yourself, right? So, um, so they think that pleasures of this kind ought to, not to be highly valued insofar as they're necessary, but they do delight in these pleasures and gratefully recognize the kind fondness of Mother Nature, who uses the most alluring sweetness to entice her children to what of necessity much must be done. So to despise physical beauty, to wear away one's strength, to turn nimbleness to sloth, to waste the body in fasting, to injure one's health and reject the other delights of nature. He's talking about the ridiculousness of the ascetic monasticism. Um, he says, all of this they think is absolutely insane. In other words, they live and they enjoy physical pleasures. In fact, there's a passage in, um, and he says there are higher and lower pleasures, of course, you know, um, but, um, you know, reading books and having great ideas is a high pleasure, but it doesn't mean there aren't low pleasures too, and we should enjoy them. He talks about the pleasure of a good bowel movement <laughs> at one point, I think, you know, Thomas More, you've got a sense of humor. It is a funny, funny book also in places. Uh, but, he, but he says these people, they live temperately. They're, they don't live in excess, but they, they're certainly not going to punish their bodies or do anything like that. Um, and therefore, they embrace chiefly the pleasures of the mind, thinking them most important of all. They say that the um, most special part of them comes from the practice of virtues and the realization of the good life of the bodily pleasures, they uh, take joy in eating and drinking, and whatever produces the same kind of delight ought to be sought, but for the sake of health. Um, for such things are not ple just pleasant in themselves, but insofar as they are opposed to the attack of sickness. And he goes on and on and on and about stuff that is, um, you know, the, the hierarchy of pleasures, which is, but, um, but the fact that they're talking about pleasure as a good thing in and of itself makes me think there's an interesting connection between Platina, remember on un honest pleasure, the Honesta Voluptate, that cookbook and the health manual, and the stuff that he's talking about here um, is that uh, we should not be miserable in life. We should enjoy things and live to be good people. And that is totally in the humanist thread of everything. Um, you know, and the, the irony of Thomas More is that he... Um, will not renounce the authority of the Pope. He loses his head. He's eventually canonized, too. He's St. Thomas More in the 20th century. But, um, you know, I think despite the, the little brief dirty work he did for Henry VIII, which I don't think he had a choice in that matter either, um, I think, you know, More is one of those great humanists who promoted the idea of the dignity of humans and the ability for us to become better and to perfect ourselves. And that is only possible with the reform of the institutions around us, that we're inherently good. It's just that we're corrupted by the prevalence of greed and sloth and parasitism. And, and in that respect, he's a reformer. Even though he doesn't, doesn't abandon Catholicism, he's really a reformer. So read Utopia. It's such a great book. You'll, you'll never forget it. It's slim, slim little volume. Um, you know, of all the books that I ask you to read, The Prince is important. The Utopia, I think, is just as important historically um, as a landmark in Western thought. So for next time, we'll get into the dirty details of the late medieval Catholic Church, um, or I should say the, the Christian Church in the West. Um, and uh, we'll talk, uh, eventually we'll get to Luther and 
Zwingli and Calvin and all those other people. Um, I'm not sure of how the pacing will work, but we'll we'll figure this out. I'm not sure where I'm going to post these either, but but um, but that's it for this time. Um, go read Thomas More. <laughs>